Hey, this is Matt McCauley. It's November 23rd. It's a Tuesday. It's a beautiful Tuesday, at least right here in the Pacific Ocean. We got a big show for you coming up today. I'm making money with Matt McCauley. We are going to talk about the markets. A bit of a pullback yesterday. Is it time for maybe that pullback people are talking about? Maybe it's a great buying opportunity. Talk about Bitcoin. Pullback last week has been kind of going sideways for a little while. Again, potential another opportunity. We're going to talk about the one device that we all need all the time and some investment opportunities in there. It's the battery, folks. Then we're going to dive into the mailbag. We're going to take some mail from you. It's not all good, but I'll address it. And then finally, we're going to dive into the ARK Innovation ETF, the ARKK, and some stocks in there, a six pack of stocks that are down at least 20% that look like potentially great long-term buying opportunities. All this and more coming up right now on Making Money with Matt McCall. All right, folks, again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. Man, it's so great to be back. Sorry, it's been a week. Um, it's been a bit of a travel uh, week for me here. I'm right now down in Nicaragua, which is my second home. And um, I wish I had a background for you right now, but the lighting doesn't work looking out the Pacific Ocean out there. Not a lot of waves today, but it's a, it's a beautiful day here in, in what I call paradise. But we got a big show for you today, so I want to jump into it. We have the markets yesterday turning around a little bit. Uh, we rallied to new all-time highs. And then we ended up closing down all the major averages. Uh, we rallied initially on the fact that President Biden came out and said that he's going to have uh, Jerome Powell continue to be the Fed chairman. Uh, Brainyard was the other option, a uh, little Lil Brainyard, something like that. I have messed up her name. Um, uh, it's, it's a woman, by the way. She will be the vice chairman of the Fed. So this was taken as a bit of a good thing for a lot of stocks, especially in financials, because it indicates that likely interest rates will continue to creep up over the next couple of years. US dollar was up yesterday as well, but that hurt some of the innovation in the growth stocks because there is a perception that the growth stocks will be hurt by higher interest rates. And I, I agree, interest rates will likely continue to move higher in the near future. However, based on historical basis, uh, I don't see interest rates being a real major concern uh, for me. I just don't, I don't see it happening. So. Let's take a look here real quick at the chart. This is the S&P 500 we'll take a look at. As you can see, uh, right here was, was yesterday. I mean, we hit an all-time high intraday, then closed on the low of the session. So we closed down, and I could take a look here. It, it's early, it's not, the market's not even open yet here. It's about 8.35 East Coast time. Uh, but I can see here, the markets are down about two tenths of percent here uh, with about 55 minutes until the open, uh, as you can see here on the spiders. So a little bit more weakness, I think we're gonna have a bit of a follow through and we could have a pullback. Uh, the chart I just showed you, we could pull back three to 5% and still be well above support, well above the moving averages and probably be a great long-term buying opportunity heading into 2022. As bullish as I am on the roaring 2020s, it does not mean there will not be pullbacks of five to 10%, uh, which are uh, you know normal pullbacks, 10 to 20%, uh, which is what we call a correction even 20 plus percent, which is termed a bear market. There will be other recessions during the roaring 2020s. Just keep in mind that nothing goes straight up, especially not the stock market. And some of the greatest stock market winners, I should say every of the, all of the greatest stock market winners, the quadruple digit winners, all had multiple pullbacks along the way of 20% or more. It's just normal, it's just, just how the market works. Nothing goes straight up. Things get overextended to the upside and then down to the downside, creating both buying and selling opportunities along the way. Uh, right now, I think if, if any type of pullback we see is gonna be very short-lived, and I'm looking to actually create some buying or looking to uh, create a list of buying opportunities, which I always do, but adding to it uh, this week while I'm doing some research in this shortened holiday week. All right, so that's kind of where we stand with the markets right now. Now, I'll touch on Bitcoin here real quick. I'm not going to talk about it too much here today, but it's trading just below 57,000 right now. And it's it's funny because it trades near 60,000 on, on little ticks up here and there. And it doesn't seem very exciting. But if you told me a year ago, we're going to see Bitcoin at 60,000, uh, I would have been jumping around like a little kid on Christmas morning. Uh, and if I'm looking down here, it's not like I'm looking away from you. I have computers set up here right now. Uh, as my makeshift studio uh, here in Nicaragua. But it's funny, when I look at the price of Bitcoin here, it comes up in Cordobas, uh, which is Nicaragua currency, and it's about 2 million Cordobas right now. I remember coming here a couple of years ago and it was a couple hundred thousand Cordobas, now it's 2 million Cordobas, just to give you an idea of how 
quickly and how much Bitcoin's gone up. I still love Bitcoin long term. Could it pull back to 50 before it goes to 100,000 easily? Could it 40 for 100? I don't know. Uh, anybody who says they know is probably lying to you. I do believe that it will be much higher. I think inflation will continue to hang around. The U.S. dollar going up, I think, is going to be great for Bitcoin as well, as well as higher interest rates. So I think Bitcoin will continue to do well, as well as, well as a lot of the old coins as well that, that I like. So I just want to give you a quick update of my view on that. Um, <clears throat> so let's jump into the device that everybody needs. It's basically in everything. It's in all these devices I have right here. And then I have quite a few. Maybe I'll take a picture and put it on Twitter of all the crazy devices I have here. But it's batteries. And battery technology is due for a major, major um, once in a generational change, in my opinion. You know, the lithium ion battery changed things dramatically. Uh, that was the, Dr. John Goodenough, who's now, I believe, either 99 or 100 years old, still, I think, associated with the uh, University of Texas. He's down in Texas. He's also now a huge proponent of a solid state battery, which if you know me, I think the solid state battery will be the technology that will end up being the next breakthrough uh, when it comes to uh, battery technology. And it's already here. It's just tough to scale it out and stuff to get it big enough to be in cars. But it's something, again, during the roaring 2020s that I think will come to fruition and we'll see solid state batteries. It doesn't mean there won't be other battery technologies along the way. There will be. Uh, but that's just one uh, that, I, that I'm looking at. So, you know, it's that one device, as I mentioned, that it's really needed for everyday life. It's everywhere. Look around you, whether you're watching your office, uh, maybe you're listening to your car. Uh, at home, just look around. I can look around here and it's just the batteries everywhere. You know, uh, Statista, which does a lot of numbers and, and, and um, estimates, uh, in 2020, the global demand uh, for batteries was 185 gigawatt hours. And consumer electronics made up about 60 of it. It's so about a third of it was consumer electronics. Stationary batteries, about 25. Transportation, about 100. So transportation was a little over 50%. By 2030, so this is in a 10 year time frame, it's going to go over tenfold to 2035 or the 2000, yeah, 2035 gigawatts per hour. Uh, transportation alone will be 1,745, and most of that obviously is coming from EVs. Um, lithium ion batteries will be shifted. We're still going to see lithium ion batteries in the first iteration of electric vehicles, um, the major iteration, the, the big push we're going to see in the next few years. There's still going to be lithium ion batteries. Solid state batteries will not be scalable to the second half of, of this decade um, at, the, at the earliest. Well, and it may only be a few companies that are actually doing it at that time. But now is the time going to be investing in that. So two companies that kind of jumped out, and I'll pull them up here in the charts in a second. One is uh, one that has not even um, been converted over. The merger's not been complete yet. And this is uh, a company that goes by the name of Solid Power. Uh, but as you can take a look here, I'll pull up the chart for you. Um, the, the symbol is DCRC, Decarbonization Plus Acquisition Corp. It's a SPAC. So there is a definitive agreement for it to merge uh, into this uh, SPAC. The valuation where the price is right now is like, give or take about $1.5 billion. So not that big of a company. And there's somewhat of a what I consider a quasi solid state battery. You know, it's a little different than your traditional solid state battery that uses ceramic, which, which is in the middle that, that it passes through. And, you know, for lithium, it is liquid and that's what makes it so dangerous and, and gives it the uh, and it doesn't hold its power as well. So the good news, though, about uh, solid power is that a lot of solid state batteries I mentioned second half of the decade. Solid power claims that they will be able to reach mass production of its battery by 2023. It's almost 2022. So that's not too far away. And that's going to be a couple of years ahead of the, the solid state batteries that are also pursuing this. And, you know, most big name battery companies or, you know, ones that, that we hear about also have big name investors or partners or backers in it. Uh, Solid Power fits this mold as well. Uh, they have both Ford and BMW that invested early in the company and both um, are set up to, um, to run pilot programs with the batteries next year in 2022. So those are obviously two very big companies that are backing it. As I mentioned, it's a $1.5 billion company, give or take. Uh, QuantumScape, which also went public uh, just recently in the last year, symbol QS, is a solid state battery company that years away from mass production, valued at $14 billion. So about nine times the size, just to give you an idea of what that $1.5 billion means. 
they also have a business partnership with SK Innovation. Uh, it's a big company out of South Korea. They're big into batteries uh, and electronics as well. And they want to help with the mass commercialization of this. So uh, they also invested about 30 million into the pipe deal that was during the SPAC transition. So the next one we'll take a look at here is a GW, um, GWH is the symbol on this one. And uh, again, a, a newer company as well, uh, ESS Tech here, I'll pull it up. This is a uh, battery that's a little bit different, not solid state, not lithium ion. The composition of, this, of the electrolytes in this battery uh, is actually water, salt, and iron. And guess who backs it? Again, you know, most of these are backed by big names. Bill Gates uh, backs this company. And what they're trying to do is a little different. They're looking to solve the major issue in the clean energy business. As you can see here, this is when it started trading after the SPAC. You know, $10, it jumped up to 28 and it's been kind of drifting lower, but consolidating around 14 to $16 um, recently. Not a lot of volume in the stock, stock, to give you an idea. But one of the major issues that you have with solar and wind power is that the sun is only up so many hours a day and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So they need battery storage that once this, this energy is harnessed, it gets harnessed and they need a battery stores to store it for times when the sun's not out and the wind's not blowing. That is key. That, that you, I, I can't emphasize how important that is to the future of clean energy. Well, this company is looking to solve this problem. Um, their materials, you know, the, the, what's nice about this is the three materials that are needed, I just mentioned, water, salt, and iron quite abundant and not expensive. Whereas you look at your traditional lithium ion battery, prices for lithium are going up, tough to get, China's trying to kind of corner the market. Cobalt, same thing, price is going up. Majority, 70% comes from the uh, DRC, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Over 70% uh, is then from there goes over to China. China's really kind of uh, monopolizing it, so that's not good. Uh, prices are gonna go up. Uh, vanadium, another resource, expensive, that's in that same realm. So these are three sources, uh, resources in the lithium ion battery that they're not uh, coming from places that, that I consider safe. Uh, at the same time, uh, they're pricey. So that, that's not the kind of uh, business that I want to be in, if you think about it. And also the company claims, uh, ESS Tech claims that their battery will hold store, store energy for about 12 hours versus your traditional lithium ion batteries for so about 3x. It doesn't sound like a lot, 12 hours to me, but you know, it's still 3x better than what we have here today. So they currently have one product available. Uh, they call it the Energy Warehouse. It looks like uh, the back of a semi-truck or, you know, or a, um, uh, a modular that would go on to rail. So it's exactly what it would look like, but the battery storage is within there. Uh, they're also um, looking to build out a second product uh, they're calling it energy centers. This large battery uh, is intended for utilities that use clean energy, solar and wind. Uh, and that's supposed to begin trials next year in 2022. And believe it or not, the company expects to generate its first profit in 2023. So the reason I picked these two uh, battery stocks is two, because they're, they're kind of under the radar. You probably never heard of either one. Uh, the other reason I brought these up is because they both I mean, again, these are according to the company, since some analysts, it's, it, we'll see if it comes to fruition, but expected to become either profitable or, or in the case of uh, ESS tech here, or going back to solid power, uh, both by 2023 to be profitable like ESS tech or solid power have uh, uh, mass scalability. Two things that a lot of solid state batteries, which I love, just aren't there yet. They're years away. And, and, and when it comes to investing in batteries, if you follow me, you know this is the approach I take. I take what's called the basket approach. Because I don't know if ESS Tech's gonna be the big winner. I don't know if Solid Power is gonna be the big winner. Maybe it's QuantumScape, maybe LiCycle, which is uh, the North America's largest recycler of lithium ion, ends up being a big winner next couple of years as, uh, a lithi um, of lithium, sorry, uh, as lithium demand goes up. Um, there's so many different battery stocks out there, folks, that I wanna create the basket and not try and be here and pick the one because I'm fairly, fairly certain that I'm going to be correct on the mega trend of batteries going up. I just don't know. I, I'm not going to claim to know which one that I think is the best. So you create that basket. So if you say to yourself, I'm going to invest $5,000 in battery technology for roaring 2020s, I believe what Matt's saying. Then you put a thousand and five, five different stocks. 
sure, you may the, the biggest winner may only have a thousand in it, but the biggest loser only has a thousand in it. So it, you really the reward to risk ratio works in your favor ninety nine point nine percent of the time. There'll be some times where even I say, listen, this this company I love and I want to have more of this company. But typically, the basket approach for the average investor is the best way to go. And remember, there's three goals that we have with this show, folks. We want to have fun. We want to make money. And what I just did right there is educate you as well on how to approach uh, asset management when it comes to uh, building out your portfolios. You know, I wanted to talk about Apple a little bit moving into the electric vehicle space, but I'm going to save that for later this week. I'm not sure what day it's going out because obviously our next show should be Thursday and that is Thanksgiving. So maybe I'll tape it Wednesday night and get it out. <clears throat> but when it comes to um, Apple making strides, the rumors are, according to Bloomberg, uh, they're going to have launched their autonomous vehicle, which is obviously going to be electric, not just electric, but autonomous, no steering wheel, no pedals, next four years. So I want to, I want to, that's, that's pretty much a whole show in itself. So I'm going to talk about that later. I want to talk about it today, but uh, we will talk about that a little bit later. I also want to uh, talk about art and the stocks, but let's jump into the mailbag here a minute. And there's been a lot of comments because uh, I've been doing a podcast for many, many years. Uh, I've been doing radio shows many, many, many years ago. Uh, I've been on television over 1,500 times, probably 2,000 times uh, on Fox Business, Fox News, uh, the old Glenn Beck Network, CNN, you name it. And um, it, it's now that I'm living on Stansberry Research's YouTube page, which was mainly built around uh, Danny Camboni, and a lot of her followers tend to be gold bugs, and, and the fact that I don't like gold, they definitely hate me. Uh, so I have some, some mail here, and it doesn't bother me because I've gotten thick skin over the years of being in the media for a very long time. But I just want to say some of this and, and uh, read some of these and just tell you my rebuttal to them, because some of them are just complete BS, to be honest with you. One says I should be a politician. It's a rich person's view that is out of touch with the mass majority of people. I will tell you this. I, I think politicians left and right majority, not every politician, majority of politicians are terrible. I, I don't think because they're elected to help us and, and they are working for us, but they don't. Uh, so I, 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 th I take that. That's one that actually bothers me. I'm definitely not a politician. And that person clearly does not know me. A rich person view that's out of uh, out of touch. Uh, that, that's complete BS, too. I'm from a family of five. Uh, low middle class. Uh, I worked my ass off. I went to six colleges. I've been working since I was 12 years old. Bought my first car. Um, <clears throat> ate tuna helper and, and stuff out of a box in my 20s as I built my businesses. I've sold them since. But I've worked my ass off. So uh, that, again, complete BS, out of touch. Uh, that, do I believe that everybody could become wealthy? Yes. And the reason that I worked my ass off to become wealthy is I have the freedom. The freedom to do what I want when I want. The freedom to be in Nicaragua right now doing this podcast, trying to educate people. I don't have to do this. You're right, I do have money. But I'm doing this because I love it. It's my passion. And I'm here to help people because I want other people to have the opportunity I have. Uh, the next one is this guy thinks he's brilliant because he discovered some age-old wisdom. When you are a momentum trader, there's ostensibly no such thing as a market crash or a bear market. Well, two things there. Listen. If this is age-old wisdom, then I apologize. You're, you're smarter than I am. But investing, folks, is not easy, but it's really simple. You invest in solid companies for the long term. It's hard because you have to weather the ups and downs of a bear market, of a recession. You might sell when it goes up, sell when it goes down, not buy early enough. There's a thousand things that could go wrong. It's very similar to getting in shape. It's very simple. You work out and you eat better. But it's not easy to get to the gym every day. It's not easy to make a salad versus grabbing some fast food on the way home. Same thing with investing. So if I if this bothers you, then turn it off because I'm going to continue to hammer that because you need to hear it over and over. That's like me, like saying if I'm a trainer, I'm telling you to work out that I'm sharing some age old wisdom. That's fine. We all need to hear it, and not everybody's heard it. I'm here to help you in that path to this financial freedom, folks. So he said it's roaring for the top one percent, savings at its lowest and debt at its highest levels. That's just not true. Uh, that is just false. Uh, saving is not at its lowest levels at all, and debt is not at its highest level. So that is just false. Uh, for the majority of Americans, it sucks, but for wealthy people, it's the same. Again, folks, <clears throat> that attitude, why, like, what, what, what does that get you anywhere? Like, why does that get people angry that there's wealthy people out here? There's people that are so much more wealthier than me right outside here. It doesn't bother me. 
Who cares? Look at them as a person, not as, a, as a, what, their, what their dollar sign is worth. It's crazy. It says, never trust a man who wears sneakers with a suit. I think that's pretty funny because uh, that's fine. I like wearing sneakers with a suit because it's much more comfortable in my feet than a lot of the, my dress shoes that I have. Um, your stock will go up. How blind are you? Majority of U.S. population doesn't own stock. You're misleading people. Uh, and apparently we peasants, uh, I do like the word peasants, but I don't use it derogatory like that, will continue to bear the consequences when it all falls apart because of inflation. The majority of U.S. population, I think it's about 55, 56 percent or so now have exposure to the U.S. market. So a little over majority. But I agree with you. More people should have exposure to the stock market. I agree. And a very easy way to do that is through if you have a job. Um, your company sponsor program, whether it be a 401k or 403b if you work in the school districts. Um, but that's that's one of the great ways to get into it. And I'll tell you, I started my first company that way by just putting money away in my 401k and then I pulled that out and started my company. So I think it's a great way. We all, most of us have the opportunity to do that. If you're watching this show, you probably have some money laying around and you have the opportunity. If you have to start somewhere, I don't care if it's $100, put it away and keep adding to it every month. So Again, I, I think that's that's a very negative way to view life. He's probably correct about stocks going higher, but I bet he doesn't know when to get out. He's going to lose when everybody else loses. I don't have a crystal ball. You're right. I don't know when to get out. So I, I'll give you that. I do know that if I invest in companies that are part of mega trends that I believe will continue to move higher, I have a diversified portfolio, it doesn't matter about when getting out. It's a matter about growing over time. Uh, last one says, I cannot stand that this guy is part of Stan's rear. He's a total opposite of our beloved Daniela. Daniela and I are friends, so you, could, you shouldn't really put people against each other. Uh, second of all, because Daniela interviews a lot of people who love gold, that's fine. I don't have to like gold. You don't have to like my stocks, but you don't have to be personal about it. You don't, I, I, I don't like gold. I don't own any. I have no intention of ever owning any gold. Maybe my view may change. I don't know, but that's just my view, folks. So that's what you have to realize here. If you're better off listening to different views outside of what you do. If you're Republican, all you do is listen to Fox News or you're a Democrat, all you do is listen to MSNBC. That's good. You feel good about yourself, but you have to open your mind to other things. I'm open to gold. I just don't see it right now. And it got hit yesterday with the dollar going up. And I think the dollar keeps going up. So I don't think it's a good idea for gold right now. All right. <clears throat> now let's talk stocks before we wrap it up here. Um, I want to look at the six pack of ARC stocks. So let me pull up here the ARK Innovation Fund. That's Kathy Wood, as you probably know. Uh, the symbol is ARKK. And we'll take a look here. Uh, it's at some nice support level here. It's between 100 and like 107, right in this area. A lot of support, folks. And uh, I, I think it's probably not a bad buying up to somewhere down in here, to be honest with you. But, you know, she goes after some very uh, mega trend stuff like me. We don't agree on everything, but a few. But here's a six pack of stocks. And let me show you a chart here really quick to give you an idea uh, of this. So I pair this, here are the six stocks. Teladoc, Beam Therapeutics, 10X Genomics, DraftKings Square, DocuSign. And this is a chart that shows the percentage of off the highs. Everywhere from DocuSign being down 20% to Teladoc being down 63%, folks. Some big pullbacks along the way, but pullbacks create opportunities. So that's why I wanted to bring this up. So let's go back here and let's run through these quickly. First one is Beam Therapeutics, you can see B-E-A-M is the symbol. Again, sitting on some nice long-term support here at 80. It's a $5.5 billion company. Uh, they use base editing. They target a single base in the genome. Uh, so it's a genetics play. They're not expecting any significant revenue for years. It's going to be a while out, but I think this company has some huge potential. But again, this must go in a basket with other healthcare or genetic focused companies because it's too risky in my mind just to own one. You'll want to own a basket. Another one will be DraftKings. You know, DraftKings, it's a $15 billion company. It's a leading player in a sports gambling mega trend. And this mega trend is not stopping anytime soon, folks. They had revenue last year in 2020, about 614 million. By 2023, so in three years, uh, looking for 2.5 billion. So about 4X growth over three years. That's fantastic. Still losing money though. Even 2023, expect to lose over a dollar a share. Maybe that's why it's getting hit. But I will tell you, man, it's taken a big beating. And uh, you go back here, really big support at 35. It's trading just above there now. Could break that, I don't know. But I, I, I see it as, as a nice kind of a, a play down here on this pullback because sports gambling's not going away. The stock that got hit the hardest in that list is Teladoc, $17.5 billion company. People know me, they know I love this company. We had it way, way back in the day. It took some off the table. 
Um, <clears throat> Teladoc is, a, as I mentioned, $17.5 billion global leader in telehealth. So it took a huge run up. Let me see if I can zoom out here a little bit. During the pandemic, as you can see, I mean, big run up during the pandemic, obviously, as people were stuck home and had to see the doctor via telehealth. I actually, in about three minutes, have a uh, video with um, one of my doctors, as a matter of fact. That's why I'm talking so fast. Um, the company had a uh, revenue of $553 million in 2019, 2021 up to over $2 billion, and in 2023, $3.2 billion. So it's still growing, and that, to me, should turn a profit around 2024. This has been beaten up. Could it keep falling lower? Yes, but I think this stock regains its highs during the roaring 2020s, which from here is at least a triple. So I think it's a huge, huge upside uh, for Teladoc. Telehealth is not going anywhere, folks. Uh, next company is 10X Genomics, symbol TXG. Um, very choppy charts, kind of in, in, in a consolidation pattern here over the last few months, $16.5 billion company. It's a life sciences company that uses software, hardware, um, and science, both biology and chemistry. Um, for its clients and 84% of its sales come from consumables and software. And that's a really nice uh, uh, place to be. You know, think genetic testing, 2022, 298 million in sales, 2023, looking for 908 million, profitable in 2023. You gotta love that. Square, $97.5 billion company, uh, big FinTech is a play in crypto is the cash app. Um, 2019 at 4.7 billion in sales, by 2023, you're looking for over 23 billion in sales. Man, I like this. 2023, looking to make $2.82 a share from $0.84 cents last year. Great opportunity and a pullback for me for a big cap company. Finally, last one, DocuSign. We all know what that is. It's the cloud-based agreement signature software company. Uh, it looks like their revenue is going from fiscal year 2021, which just ended at $1.45 billion up to $3.4 billion in three years, and $0.90 cents a share last year to 3 bucks a share in three years from now. So, um that was very quick. I want to get through those uh, as we're closing in on the 30 minute mark. And again, I told you I have a call coming up in like literally 30 seconds. Um, but thank you all so much. Please comment below, good or bad. It's fine. I want to make this show better and better. I mean, I can't be everything to everybody, folks. Honestly, I'm doing my best here and I'm trying to, again, three things. We want to have fun. We want to educate you and we want to make money along the way. So if some things I say piss you off sometimes, that's okay. I'm not doing it intentionally. I'm just trying to help you to get on the path to the financial freedom that you want to achieve. So again, folks, thank you so much. If I don't hear, talk to you from uh, before Thanksgiving, have a great Thanksgiving holiday this Thursday. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll see you very soon. Again, I'm Matt McCall, and this was Making Money with Matt McCall.